You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Today, we're going to close our series, our little mini-series that we've called The Moral of the story. And we're going to dive right into God's word and we're going to ask the Lord to bless this time. And so let's just do that right now. Lord, I pray over these next few moments, Lord, that you would capture our hearts, capture our minds, and Lord, do in these moments only what you can do. Lord, I pray that you would be stirring inside of each of us, each listener online. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before I preach, before we get to the moral of the story, I just want to remind you that when you like or when you comment or when you share what's happening right now, it makes a huge difference. And so before we get into the message, would you just lean forward to that device, type in a little comment, or would you like or would you share this with a friend or someone that needs to hear? It does make a difference. Amen? Amen. Well, let's preach. The moral of the story. These last four uh, sermons uh, in Mark chapter 4 have been tied to Four different parables that we've seen that Jesus preached in Mark chapter 4. And let's just remind ourselves of what a parable is. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. The idea is that there's more than what your eye sees on the natural level. And just like with a good story, you got to be paying attention. There are layers of meaning with life application that's relevant. And so we need to understand what these things mean. And so there's different angles. You can look at these stories. There's a depth of understanding. And again, we don't want to miss it, so we need to find the key to unlocking the mystery or the moral of each of these stories. Well, I just want to give you the moral of the story right up front, even before we read from God's Word. The moral of the story today is that small things matter. If you're sitting with somebody, just turn to them and say, small things matter. If we were here in the sanctuary, I'd be saying, say it after me, small things matter. And you can do that right where you are. And ultimately, when we get to the end of the message, we're going to see that the gospel may seem small when it's presented to you. But when the faith of the gospel grows in your heart and in your mind, it will produce great change. And I believe that to the bottom of my heart. Without further ado, Mark chapter 4, let's look at verse 30 through 34, the parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed. This is what it says. It says, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of of God. If you've got your copy of God's Word with you, you can underline kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many parables, he spoke the word to them and they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. When you read that, it is clear that the parable, the story here, relates to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus wants to give us insight into what the kingdom of God is like. Well, the kingdom of God, the way I see it, is the rule and the reign of God in the hearts of people in a way that affects the way that we live our lives. And one other way you could say it is you bring a piece of heaven to earth. That's the kingdom of God. And to illustrate that, Jesus uses another story about seeds. 
What's the moral of the story? Small things matter. And in this story, we're going to see that the key to understanding this is that Jesus is the key. When Jesus is speaking this parable, he is first and foremost talking about himself. And he's speaking of himself in all four of the parables that we have, uh, have devoured over these last few weeks. And we see that the seed is the word. The word is Jesus, right? And the, the light, uh, the one with the lamp was, was Jesus as well. And again, the seed here, it, Jesus is being scattered. In the story, Jesus, his ministry is like a mustard seed. And I don't know if you can tell what's in this bowl here, but there are mustard seeds here in this bowl. And I I mean, conservatively, there are 10,000 or more mustard seeds in this small little bowl. I mean, if I, I probably have a hundred just right there, just being poured out. They, they're so tiny, and Jesus uses this as the illustration. Now, I don't know if you remember, if you're a part of the Gateway Church, we use these mustard seeds. In fact, this was the leftover from what we put in little bottles. Remember this? <coughs> We said, uh, when we were building the, the building, we said it was, there was faith to reach one more, and we filled it with little mustard seeds, and we put probably a couple hundred, maybe three or four hundred in each little bottle. And I just want to remind you, the reason we did that on the backside of us doing that was Matthew 17, 20. Inside each of those little containers said, reach one more. On the flip side, Matthew 17, 20, you can look that up. Now, a mustard seed. You're saying, what's up with a mustard seed, right? It, it wasn't the smallest seed in the world, but it was probably the smallest seed that the Jews sowed in their gardens. And I can just imagine, Jesus is telling this story off in the distance. He maybe have seen somebody, a farmer, sowing mustard seeds. It's quite likely. And a mustard seed is a traditional symbol of all that is tiny. And so over the last two weeks, uh, or two weeks ago, we talked about that the kingdom of God was like a mystery, right? Today we're saying it's like a seed, it's small, and Jesus is the key here, right? Jesus is the key, and he's the word, and so it's tiny, and it's a mystery, and you think about the story, remember last week, or two weeks ago, we mentioned this, that Jesus, he came to earth as a baby, tiny, right? After 30 years, no one had recognized who he was. He started to preach, and then he gathers 12 disciples. Again, a small amount of people. By Acts chapter 1, 120 people were gathering. By Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people had given their hearts to Jesus. By Acts chapter 4, 4,000. His ministry was growing like a tiny seed and blossoming like a mustard seed. Now, the question is, how does the kingdom of God start? Well, it starts off small. And the point is, is how could Jesus be the Messiah? He's speaking this parable. People aren't understanding exactly who he is. How could this be the start of the kingdom of God? Well, if you fast forward 100 years to 100 A.D., look what happened. We see in 100 AD, there were 181 million people on the earth, according to facts. 500,000 estimated were born again. That's a ratio of 360 to 1. 360 people on the earth to one believer. To 1,000 AD, it goes 270 million people on the earth. 1 million people were born again at that point. So the ratio shortens to 269 to one believer. If you go then to 1500 A.D., there were 425 million people on the earth. Five million were estimated to be born again at that point, a ratio, again, of 84 to 1. You see what's happening here? It's growing. If you fast forward to 1900, you know, 1. 1.6 billion people now on the earth, 40 million of them were born again. That's a ratio of 40 to 1. In 1950, right, 2.5 billion people on the earth, 80 million people were born again. That's a ratio of 30 to 1. A couple more. 1980, it was a good year. I was four years old. 
4.5 billion people on the earth, 275 million people were born again. That's a ratio of 15 to 1. Go 10 more years to 1990, 5.2 billion people on the earth, 500 million born again, a ratio of 9 to 1. You say, why are you talking about this? Well, what seemed to be small at the beginning has grown and really as population in the world has increased, the amount of people that know Jesus has increased also. From 1990 till today, that's about 30 years or so, 28 years, we are now at 7.8 billion people. And today, globally, it is estimated that the church is growing by 80,000 people per day. People that are, know Jesus, that are accepting Christ as their Savior, 80,000 people per day. And it's estimated that 510 new churches, I love that, the new churches are being formed every day. When I was going through those statistics this week, and I've used those a couple years back, uh, that kind of progression, and so you may have seen that before. But you know what came to my mind? Is that the coronavirus, as contagious as it is, it has nothing on Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Thanks, Pastor Bobby. I heard that. All right. And his ministry. And Jesus was the key. And so we watch his ministry, the kingdom of God, growing. And again, we're, our key today is that small things matter. You, can you think of something in your life that started off small and, but ended up with some significant uh, impact? I want to give the example of our Global 6K. And I know some of you are proud of wearing your Global 6K uh, medal. Uh, some of you signed up and you're saying, ah, I don't know if it's going to make a big difference. Maybe you signed up your kids at $12.50 to be able to do the Global 6K. And you're saying, I'm not sure if $12.50 makes a difference. Or maybe you signed up for $25 using the Gateway 50 um, uh, promotion code, so it was 50% off. Or maybe you signed up at full price, $50, and you're saying, I don't know if that really made a difference. But when you put all of those together, and 71 people participating, and all the effort, and all the things, and now we're sitting at over $22,000 been given to Global Missions, uh, to Team World Vision in particular, 441 people will have water for life. Again, what started off small has grown. So let's just take a moment. Can you think of something that started off small in your life or in your circles that ended up significant? Let's take a minute. Let's discuss that right where you are. All right. When you think of small beginnings and you think of Jesus and his ministry, it did not start off all that impressive. It started small, and no one knew how it would grow. And the point is, everything starts off small. There's another little component of this story that was interesting to me. It says in verse 32 that when it grew up, the, the mustard seed, it became large, larger than all the other garden plants and put out large branches so that the birds of the air could make their nest in the shade. And I want to talk about those birds for a moment. On first thought, when I first read this, my mind went to, okay, the seeds grow and they provide large enough branches to accommodate a nest and the birds utilize it. And there are other, my mind went to other examples in Scripture, like in Daniel and in Ezekiel, where there's imagery of a tree providing shade and protection for a kingdom. And, and I really like that. And I thought, oh, this is great. The trees, these bushes, the mustard seed, they provide a blessing, Right? But if you pause and as you dig in and you look at these four stories together, there was a consistency in the seed. The seed was always Jesus, the Word, remember? And Jesus was the Word, and, and that was consistent. Well, what were the birds a little earlier in the other stories? Well, the birds represented Satan. And I'm thinking, oh, man. There needs to be some awareness here to be aware. And in fact, Wearsby says this. He says, if we are to be consistent in our interpretation, we must take into consideration that 
both of these parables were taught on the same day. Going back to the first parable we talked about. The growth of the kingdom, he says, will not result in conversion of the world. In fact, some of the growth, this is the key, will give opportunity for Satan to get in and to go to work. And there are examples in Scripture early on. Uh, Judas, of course, one of the 12 disciples, kind of Satan deceived him and got in and worked. Ananias and Sapphira in the early church, and there are other examples. And then Wearsby concludes, he says, the bigger the net, the greater the potential of catching both good and bad fish. It's interesting. What it reminded me of when I kind of got my mind around this was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. that says that the enemy, he prowls around the earth seeking who he can devour. He wants to take us out. And I don't know, my mind also went to marriages where Satan, he will try to destroy your marriage with misunderstandings, accusations, different things. And there's dis- all different ways that the enemy will try to destroy us. And I'm curious, how in your life has the enemy tried to stop your plans? There's lots of ways. Uh, over the 24 years and a couple weeks that Jessica and I have been married, that the enemy has tried to get in and through misunderstandings, through accusations, through mistakes, through sin, uh, different things that have caused our marriage to thrive at times, but others... Uh, to, to really struggle. And I'm just curious, in your life, how has the enemy tried to stop your plans? Would you discuss that with the people you're with? Just turn and discuss, a minute and a half. How has Satan tried to stop your plans? All right, church, we want to remember that small things matter. And just like a mustard seed that grows and matures, it really matters. There are a lot of different ways that we can look at this story. We could put the Gateway Church in there. In fact, I had done some study to do that and kind of looking at our roots going back to 2001. And uh, really our roots went even back beyond that to the Grand Haven Assembly of God where one of the things they were known for were revival meetings, healings, and prayer. And the, the foundation that we've built on over the last 18 years since 2001 when we were established as the Gateway Church. I, you know, you may look at our progress and say, man, you know, I thought we'd be further than we were now, uh, but I promise you that uh, we can uh, get our minds around this, that today we're online. Our reach is arguably the greatest it's ever been in the history of the church. We're not going backwards. The gospel is being preached literally to the ends of the earth. We have missionaries that are tuning in right Right now that uh, are listening and will be able to share this with uh, those that they're trying to reach. The best is yet to come. Just let me remind you, and then I'm going to dive into the, the last uh, major portion of our message. It's that we have been prophesied over that we are a powder keg of potential. Somebody in the comments, write that out. A powder keg of potential. And our foundation is in Jesus. It, it, with Jesus' story, it started off small, but it has grown substantially. That's what we've seen. Just like a mustard seed, one of the tiniest seeds in the earth will blossom. And it's not only true with the Gateway Church, it's true with you. It's true with each and every one of us. Let's put ourselves into this story of the mustard seed, that small things matter, right? And actually to do that, I want to go quickly to another story. Uh, It's a rubble story in Zechariah chapter 4. Listen to these verses real quick. It says, and then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. 
saying, well, what does that story have to do with mustard seeds or this parable that Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 4? Well, this here in Zechariah was written after the children of Israel were returning from captivity in Babylon. So they're returning back to Israel. And only two priests were willing to return with the remnant of the Jews. It was Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua and Zerubbabel. And these two guys were not well qualified. They were just willing. They were willing to go back. And they had become discouraged in their work. But the Spirit of God encourage them with these scriptures or with this. And in verse 6, the Lord spoke to Zerubbabel and told him that the work that he was doing would be accomplished by the Spirit of God, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. Then the Lord said to finish the work of the wall, finishing the city walls one brick at a time. And in verse 10, God said, For who has despised the, the day of small beginnings they will rejoice. In other words, don't despise the things that start small, one brick at a time. It will make a difference. The key is for what we see here is what Zerubbabel was doing may not have seemed significant, but the work of the Lord could not go on without his work. It was vital, and it was the will of God for him to be doing so. Again, one brick at a time. What's the key today? Small things matter. Say it again to the people that you're sitting with or that you're around, or say it out loud, even if you're by yourself. Small things matter. We are part of the kingdom. Let's put ourselves into this story. I don't know how many of you have ever dreamed about living uh, or winning a, a lottery ticket, you know, maybe one of the big mega win prizes, and, uh, and, and you think, man, if I could win $5 million, or if I could win $100,000, wouldn't that that be great. I, I've thought about it. I'm sure you have as well. But the truth is that statistics that those that win in a lottery or win in, the, uh, in ways like that and they get all this lump, big lump sum of money, it actually is not healthy for those situations in most cases. The same is true with our own kids. We don't give our kids everything that they absolutely want. We monitor and we do things appropriately in it with time. And the same is true with our lives and even our spiritual lives. Our spiritual lives are not just the result of a few big meetings, a revival or a crusade or a camp life-changing experience, which we are all in. We love camp. Instead, though, our lives are the result, listen, to small seeds of righteousness being sowed over time. Often these seeds are small like a mustard seed and it's overlooked. You look at one of these tiny things. I mean, you could, I mean, you can't even see it on the camera. I'm sure it's so tiny and, but it makes a difference. Church, we all want our lives to count, don't we? To do significant things, but we want to do these big things. That's no problem. But it's, a, it's the result of small, right choices over time. The Compound Effect book uh, it is a great book to read that kind of talks about that from a secular standpoint. But the, the truth there is that small little things over time, it absolutely makes a difference. There are so many takeaways that we could relate this to our own lives. I just have a few here that we can look at. Uh, you, you ask the question, well, why does our reputation matter? Well... Our reputation, the things we say, the things we do, they will travel with us over time, over years. Why does showing up to work on time make a difference? It's because your reputation matters. Why do we respect others around us? Why does that matter? It's small, right choices over time 
that makes a difference? Why should we keep our anger under control? Why should we make ourselves accessible accessible to others, responding to the needs of others, especially during COVID-19, or treating others the way that you would want to be treated? Why is that important? It's, again, small right choices over time that makes a difference. Why should you be hospitable? Why should you talk less and listen more? Why should you handle your daily affairs with excellence? Why should you encourage one another? The list could go on and on. Why does it matter? Well, this story, this parable in particular, is is screaming to us that small things matter. And little by little, good, right choices over time will grow, will mature, they'll develop, it'll expand. And in due time, this is the key, the seeds that you sow will bear fruit. That will be established and will last. It will make a difference. So the question that I want to leave us with and I want us to think about, and you can even comment in the comments below, is what do you need to do today that seems to be small that will make an impact in your future? Pastor Rachel actually helped me with this, uh, with this question as I was talking with her about the message. And uh, we, we boiled it down to this. And so I want all the kids and all the youth, all the adults, what do you need to do today that seems small that will make an impact in your future? See, today as we wrap up, and let's just leave that up there here for a moment. Uh, you can talk about it or think about it as we kind of close the the story or close the message. Today is all about the moral of the story. What's the big point? Well, the big point is that small things matter. And there's probably something that you can do today that will make a difference in the long run. And one of those things is turning your heart to Jesus. See, the gospel may seem small when it's presented to you. It may seem like one of these small little mustard seeds that that seems so insignificant. In fact, it's hard to even pick up just one. You can't even see it. I know that. But when faith, the faith of the mustard seed, the faith of the gospel begins to grow in your heart and in your mind, it will produce great things. It will produce great change. And it really makes a difference. And today, you're you may have be, be receiving the gift of the gospel through this message for the first time in your life. You may be receiving it for the first time saying, man, this is incredible. Uh, I need to accept Jesus. I need to get my life right with the Lord. And just like a small mustard seed, it's starting to grow. It's starting to blossom. And the, when it starts to do that, there's a moment where you need to accept Jesus. And if you're ready to make that decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to pray a quick prayer. This can be your prayer. Would you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I ask right now that you would save me, that you take away my sin and come into my heart. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe in the power of your word. I ask that your word, like a seed, would start to grow inside of me and that it would make a difference. Jesus, do in my life what only you can do. Save me and then put me on the right path to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray that this message has been a message of hope for you. Don't stop building. Little by little. Again, what do you need to do today that might seem small, might seem insignificant, but will make an impact in your life long term? Let that sit with you. Let that go with you for the rest of the week. And God bless you. May the Lord go before you and behind you and all around you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen and amen. I hear those amens online. You can type in amen. Give me thumbs up and like it. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. 
Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.